I am leaving the comment section open on this video. Um, this is something that I've wanted to do for a hot minute. Uh, I've got one of these already pre-made. It is a beat up bag of dick. And I use it all the time. I just don't ever show it on camera. Well, my high voltage lead broke on it the other day and I thought, man, piss on all this nut. I'm gonna make another one. We're all here. Look, I'm not kidding you. This little clip, I wanted to get fancy schmancy with it on this one. Um, dude, I couldn't believe this. On Amazon, you can buy this whole bag of clips, this whole bag of project clips, this set of clips, this whole set of clips for your test leads, and even big boy clips for your test leads, and another set of battery terminals for your test leads. Now, listen. For the price I paid for this, I'm going into this with my eyes wide, stapled shut. Okay. I bought this for one clip, but I was really excited when I saw these. I have this, uh, what I call the bench jumpers. And I hate these little clips. They suck, they're tiny, they don't carry enough current. The set's getting an upgrade. I'm gonna build another set I'm going to actually build some, uh, like these jumpers here that you guys see me use all the time. I'm going to build a set out of Teflon that will last and have uh, a little bit higher abrasion resistance to many. Hey, I was excited. This whole kit of jumpers, $9.99. I was like, I'll take two, please. <laughs> I'm sure the metal engineer um, um, stuff that these little clips are made out of are only the softest metal that can be found in china but the moral of the story it'll look pretty on video and it'll work more than adequately so i mean we don't want to be woefully inadequate in this situation whatsoever this is the rest of the stuff that you're going to need to make this thing you need some hardware some screws the hardest part to fabricate is this little tip this is stainless steel filler rod as you guys all know i've got several welders over here so i just want to grab a piece of stainless steel and Put some hoopies in it. You'll see why there's a couple little hoopies in the ass end of this thing. What we're making ourselves is a shorting bar, also known as a, um, um, man, I don't even know I'm allowed to say this anymore because YouTube will strike me with a content hit or some craziness. Um, I've always heard this referred to as a bitch stick. Like you're gonna take and you're gonna move this around the inside of the transmitter cabinet because you're a scared little bitch of high voltage. Uh, me personally, I. I like to think of it as a safety bonding switch or a bonding stick. Um, there's a little bit of math that goes into this and there's a little bit of knowledge that goes into this. And um, usually when you see these, they're usually about two to about four foot long. Well, two foot in my mind is good for about anything around 5,000 volts or below, okay, which is where I do most of my work. When we go to higher voltages, we have meters that will tell us if we're depleted or not. Um, this is something that you keep around just in case your bleeder circuit decides that it's going to fail itself and you need to be able to go into the space of the high voltage and do work. Okay, so out of happy go punch drunk BBI mode, and let's, let's get serious here for a second. This is actually a really, really important tool to have, and I'd like to explain how to use it ish. Um, this is the last thing that you do before you stick your hands inside of any amplifier with high voltage is you make sure it's dead and grounded. Now, I mean, you guys don't want to see me take this old dirty wand that I have and f push it around on the inside, but you got to do it. Look, high voltage is like the world's worst demon. Okay. High voltage is the devil. It allows you to do cool shit, but it'll kill you dead. It doesn't care about your kids, your wife, your politics, your race, your color, your cre it does, none of that stupid stuff. It doesn't care about any of that. It is literally the most non-discriminant thing that man has ever created, ever. It does not care. It just wants to go to ground. 
And if that's through you, across your heart, through your skin, out your elbow, in your pinky, out your palm, meanwhile resetting every electrical system in your, in your body, this is going in your pinky and blowing out your palm, it doesn't care. It doesn't care anything about you in any way, shape, or form. It just wants to go to ground. And if that means that you get to be the fuse and you die, so be it. Now look, I want to be here for a hot minute. I, I do. I want to see my kid grow up and go to college and make adult decisions and struggle with adulting. I think it's going to be funny to watch. And uh, I want to see her be successful. And that's just one of many motivational reasons that night like living. So you respect high voltage. You don't ever grow comfortable with working with it. You fear it with a healthy fervor. You cannot see it. You cannot smell it. You don't know that you're interacting with it until it is too late. And it will, it will hurt the entire time while you're dying. Not only will this kill you, and, it, and this is minutes, by the way, you guys. High voltage doesn't really kill you by like, oh, electrocution kills you. No, what you die from is suffocation for the most part. Or you're going to have a coronary incident if the, electro, the, electro, the electrons go across your heart. So as your heart's an arrhythmia and all the chambers are firing out of sequence with each other and blood's all going the wrong way and your blood pressure's going up to your brain and then going low down on the other side, and da, 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 it's going to hurt like a mother effer the entire time as you die. And we're talking minutes minutes. Either that or your diaphragm is going to become paralyzed and you're not going to be able to breathe. And you are going to be conscious and it's going to hurt the entire time. Just putting this in perspective. So going into this with our eyes wide open, after we have verified with a meter that the voltage is depleted, okay, we're now going to go in and make sure that there's no little crisp, crispy little dem uh, demons left inside the cabinet. And we're going to take our little wandy wand and we're going to go, okay, there's no high voltage left on any components. We're not going to die. The other reason I do this video is because just this last week, I've had two separate people contact me where they've either burned themselves on their palm or they've had it go in their pinky and come out their forearm with high voltage. I got one guy out there that cannot close his hand anymore went in his pinky and it came out here in his forearm, like right here. Well, that's all the muscle track and tissue and nerves and everything that runs this portion of his hand. And this is all he's got for function. And it's like, he's got that much function and that's as much as he's got. It's about once a month. I hear on average about once a month where somebody's decided they're going to work on something. They didn't let the high voltage bleed off and they about killed themselves. So the first step is always is that you identify your workspace. That means you're gonna use a high voltage probe. And if you don't have a high voltage probe, you don't need to be putting your hands in anything high voltage. On or off, you don't. But this is your last step to help protect you. Okay? Okay. Okay, moving forward, serious talk is over now. Yay! All right, so I wanna put a big shout out to Dr. Roy J. Plunkett. Dr. Dr. Roy is the guy that discovered Teflon. And believe it or not, without this substance, which I absolutely love, um, not just in the radio world, but the whole world as a whole would be completely different. Honest. Teflon, believe it or not, is in a lot of different things and in a lot of different versions. Um, the scientific definition, I could give you all the names and stuff. I, I've got part of this is memory. I, I remember when I first started to learn about Teflon when I was about, oh, maybe 16, 17 years old. Um, it was some guideways and this thing that I was working on, and it was this different kind of plastic that felt different, and uh, you couldn't burn it, and it, it was really heat resistant, and it always had a very low a friction to it, very slick. I started looking into this. Now, this is back when you had to actually open a book. 
But they were playing around with a couple different fluoridable gases and they put them into a cylinder and they let the cylinder sit because I think they went off to go get a sandwich or lunch or something. And when they came back to release the gases out of the cylinder, which under pressure, nothing came out of the cylinder. So they went and they, they wanted to know where the gas had gone to. Well, the gas had interacted with itself, had a chemical reaction and it turned to a solid. And it was all on the inside of the cylinder and it had cooked itself onto the walls. And they discovered Teflon, or PTFE, or PTFFE, PTTFFE, to Teflon, whatever. Teflon has really, Teflon, in my opinion, is one of those things that's uh, is about as revolutionary as uh, oil or the birth of electricity. Uh, the offshoots of this stuff are in everything, and we don't even know it because this is such a versatile and wonderful substance. How we're going to capitalize, once again, thanks, Mr. Bucket, you're awesome. How we're going to capitalize on this is that we're going to take advantage of it. it's a resistance to conduct electrons. The demon electrons, the high voltage electrons, they want to crawl and they want to go down any surface that they can. Teflon is incredibly poor at this. And I had to go look this up. Hold on. Ready? Here we go. Teflon. Its electrical resistance is 10 to the 18th power per ohm per centimeter. Now, that is on a flat sheet and we're trying to conduct the high voltage through it. Okay. So like if you take mom's cutting board, which is usually not, it's nylon, but the high-end ones are Teflon. If you were to take one centimeter thick piece and try and conduct any voltage through it, that would represent, oh, uh, let's see, 10 to the 18th power, which works out to, to be an incredibly stupid number. It's like uh, 1.8 million or 180 million ohms worth of resistance. <clears throat> It's got a really high dielectric breakdown. Dielectric's a fancy term for resistance, by the way. Okay. Electrons don't want to crawl on it very much. They can't conduct over it. They can't stack upon it for the most part. Um, it's a wonderful insulator. So in a round application, now we're going to talk about service conductivity, which is roughly but not the same thing. To get to that number, we're going to take 3.6 times 1,012 ohms per every one sixteenth of, a, uh, sixteenth of an inch, which works out to be 3,643 ohms per inch, which works out to be uh, 5,291.2 ohms, pardon me, hmm, pardon me, pardon me, that works out to be 3,643 ohms per sixteenth of an inch, which turns out to be 58,291 ohms per inch, which turns out to be, well, that's 58K. Now we're talking six, 699,000 per foot ohms worth of resistance, which works out to be roughly about 1.2 million ohms for every two feet. Well, as you guys can clearly see here, we've got ourselves a two foot bar of this stuff. So we're talking millions of ohms worth of resistance to have the electrons go from here to come back to here. I like to work with the safety factor of at least 10. Okay, so if the book says that I need to have, depending on the air grain molecules, the moisture air grain molecules, the, the grains of moisture in the air at the time and your elevation and your dust content in the atmosphere you know, for X amount of volts, we're going to present X amount of inches worth of insulation. I want to have 10 times that for me to, before I apply my, my manly meat beater, you know, all about sweat. I can't do man inches now. I can't go, oh, my seven and a half inch wide hand. No. Um, before I take and I grab about four and a half inches, maybe five inches worth of this bar and intentionally expose myself to becoming a conductor. It's no joke. 
It's this no joke, and I take it real seriously. So what we have here is we've got to create ourselves a situation where we can take and put a clip on the cabinet or return source of generation, not earth ground, but the return source of generation ground, which is commonly accepted as um, where we're applying the negative field. And uh, we can take and expose this to the possible positive side of the circuit and have a closed loop deal and bring all that energy potential back to the case. Because that's all the, R, the, the high voltage wants to do is go back to the cabinet, right? So we're gonna draw ourselves some holes. We're gonna run some screws through some shit. We're gonna use some hardware. We're gonna use some bigger manly drill bits because this is just the way I have it envisioned in my head. We need bolt rounders, Phillips head screwdriver. Um, I'm gonna way overkill this one. Um, the last one I used, I used this stuff here, which is basically really soft neon sign wire you don't even need to use high voltage lead for the most part because remember you're now creating yourself insulator stick right look i am really not i'm excited about this and i wanted to do this but in the same breath if somebody goes and builds themselves one of these and ends up hurting themselves hey i'm gonna feel it's like i'm gonna kill myself on the inside but look most voltages that us as radio operators are exposed to is about 7,000 volts and below. In theory, according to the book, we only need about 8 inches of this for this to be safe for us. That's why I'm way over killing it with 2 feet. Um, in my travels, in my time, I've gone to a Conco, I've gone to all the different places that work with high voltage in the tubes, and usually the, the shorting bar that hangs out on the, the bitch stick, that hangs out on the side of the test equipment, is usually two to three and a half feet long. Just saying. So we're going to go with that, understanding our math that really all about this much is needed to really safely protect us from the high voltage at the voltages that we're working at. I mean, we're talking for this whole length of bar, we are in the 50,000 volt range, 60,000 volt range. Now, believe me, in the electrical world that I come from, from being a power lineman and that kind of thing, 50 and 60,000 volts, you've got body shield on, you've got three layered insulated gloves, you've got arm protection armor on, okay, that's all made of um, Boonan rubber silicone. You've got, you know, everything's grounded out. It's, when you start getting into thousands of volts, this, this is just the beginning of the safety for you to be able to interface with it to make sure everything is neutralized. And then on top of that, you've got this stick, they call it a hot stick, and you've got that hot stick's got interchangeable grips, and they make seven million different kinds of it, and the lengths of them vary. And I mean, people that work with high voltage on a re regular basis, their tools that they interface with the high voltage with, they, they have a very special reference for it, and they, they, they take very good care of it. If you ever have the opportunity to go watch a hot stick crew, um, go interface with live high voltage. It is a... Uh, you know, from a novice point of view, to watch what they do and how they go about doing it on a pole, working with 14,000, like 14.5 kV, uh, 7.5 kV, 9.5 kV, and so on. Um, it's an elegant dance that is nothing short of magical. But all we're talking about is building ourselves a bar that we can short a couple hundred volts out with inside of a cabinet and feel relatively safe. So. This bar is about, what I pay, $20, maybe $30 for this bar off of Amazon or eBay. Um, I'm going to put a grounding loop hoop in the end of it. I'll explain that as we go. And probably about another $10 worth of components. So for $10, you can safely insulate yourself, well, $50, you can safely insulate yourself and not die. Let's do it to it. Let's talk more do, BBI. Let's talk more do. So insulation as a whole, the way you have to think about it is that you are going to um, create as much surface area as that you possibly can between you and whatever that you're going to put yourself in, in you know, the path of being able to be a conductor with. So the total surface area of this is what really makes it an insulator. Let me turn this down a little bit. There we go. Oh, 
Yay, not super overexposed BBI, way to go. So, in an ideal world, if we wanted to, we could flute this out like a rifle, and not flute this way, but more like a Thompson machine gun. Start cutting notches in it. So go put this in a, in a lathe, and start cutting ribs in it. Okay. The surface area, this is how high voltage insulators work on power lines, by the way, is that surface area on the insulator so inside they've got themselves a really nice, super beefy fiberglass rod of some kind. And on the outside, they have a boot that is attached to the outside of the insulator. In that surface area of the insulator, that's why it's got fins on it. I'm talking about 14 kV and down. Um, they'll use a silicone boot on the outside of the insulator. And that surface area of the insulator, that's the reason it's got ribs in it, is to make it so from the high voltages point of view, you know, an insulator that's this long to the high voltages point of view is like five or six feet. Okay. Now, because of the higher transmission line weight, uh, we've developed over time that, that you know, porcelain is also a horrible conductor. It's just like this horrible conductor. So they, they have a little clip and a little metal pin. But because porcelain is such a horrible conductor through, its, through the thickness of the, of the insulator, we can hang multiple, multiple insulators, bells, hang multiple insulator bells together on a string, suspend them from a metal arm, and the surface area of each one of those insulators is what allows people to be able to have the heavy weight of the wire and then clip onto that and then it not the high voltage not leak across the top of those insulators and up to ground. Or come down to ground, or let itself find itself to potential to ground. The surface area, that's how an insulator works. So if I wanted to like almost double or triple the KV rating of this rod, now please note this is an extruded piece of Teflon and it's not perfect, I mean you can see it, it's it's like a man's weenus, it's not perfectly smooth, right? Not perfectly straight. So we put it in the lathe and it'd be like, so we'd have to you know, put a follower, drill a little tiny hole here and put the lead on it and, you know, put ribs in it, increase our surface area. Because remember that electricity doesn't want to go through the solid plastic, that's hard. It wants to take the easy path and go over the outside. Okay. which leads to another phenomenon that happens in the electrical line world. Or in certain situations, you need to get out on that wire and go work on things. Now, I've, just, I've been told about this and I've seen guys do it on YouTube, where if the insulator chain is long enough, they'll literally start crawling. And no, you gotta remember some of these insulators we're talking are like two and a half, three feet across. They'll start crawling down that insulator really slow, that stack of insulators, and slowly bring themselves to the same electrical potential as the line. And once they're down on that line, they're no longer at ground potential, they're no longer the chance of being a conductor, and they're safe. So they're on the wire conducting all this billions of volts worth of electricity and amps and shit, but because there's no pathway from them to ground, they can do work. Now, that's the reason that birds can land on transmission lines and not die. Which we all should know because mom should have taught us all this when we were like two. The birds aren't conducting the ground, so therefore you can't die. Okay. So what we're doing here is I'm mocking this up for a hot second. This little pointer, I want to make this as sharp as I possibly can. So when I go to stick it inside of something and touch to the top of a tube, dink, this is what I'm going to be making contact with is this little spike. But in the same breath, hey, I want to have a sacrificial lamb that I can just throw up on the altar and say, here, go die. And that's what this little hoop is for. The other thing is there's, you can have another kind of um, uh, insulator stick where we're going to take like, you know, like a 10 meg resistor, 
probably a hundred meg resistor that's like 30 or 40 watts and put it in here and if I wanted to stand there all day and hold it with my meter I could verify it was grounded and that meter would act as an, an additional bleeder circuit present an incredibly high but conductive insulative load a resistible load pardon me to the circuit and you could bleed the high voltage off that way I'm building this for the opposite side of that spectrum. I'm assuming the bleeders are already done. I've taken my reduction probe with my increased surface area, inserted into the project and said, okay, we're at 200 volts and it's not going any lower. The bleeders, something in the bleeders have failed. I wanna be able to take this and go, hook to the cabinet and go, dap, and then hold it there and make sure that the capacitors are fully discharged. That's what this is for. This is the same phone number that called me while I was doing this last segment. That is the third time he's called me in a row. On a Saturday, which I say on the message that I don't answer the phone because I'm closed. And I haven't been able to do a YouTube video for your all's consumption all week and it's drove me nuts. It's drove me nuts. How much you want to bet he doesn't get a call back? I don't mind if you call once, but multiple times in a row it's like, hey man, come on, dude. Hey, hey, chill out. Okay, so you want another little trip with high voltage is you want to just do away with any sharp edges, like really sharp edges. I want this thing to be so I can go like precision, reach in here and go bink, bink, bink. The only time I want to use this is if I've got something mass and it goes Phew. Now the other idea behind this is if there's too high of an electrical load, we want something that can physically absorb the electrical pulse. Like most guys that instantly go, oh, resistor, because that's what a glitch resistor does. And it absorbs the huge electrical pulse that takes place when there's all of a sudden abrupt conductivity to ground. Um, as far as the electrons go, this builds a little bit of flexibility into the circuit, but I mean, there's gonna be some engineer out there that's like, oh my God, really? I actually wanna create a hook for me to hang this thing. And I don't wanna hang it with point down, I wanna hang it with point up. Safety third, always safety third. So, first, third, second. Eliminate all your sharp edges, because then you can have accidental arcing that goes from that, but I want to take and I'm going to hoop this around on a half hoop, like so. This is absolutely not necessary, but this is just me being me. It's just me being me, let me be me, okay? Let me be. Have you ever built something and then after you get it put together, you're like, oh yeah, what did I, th when I thought this through and I planned out the plan in my brain, what, I, what did I plan on using these little extra parts for? And Don's on me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a dingus, yo. I was gonna put those two ground tabs together in association with this ground tab to increase my total surface of metal mass. <laughs> so if I do end up having a huge <laughs> or I gotta short something out, dink, um, that electrical short is not gonna use this as a fuse going to our high voltage lead. So I need to take this back apart and try again. All right. Ah, just like I got it pictured in my head. Uh, what inspired this video is the other day I was trying to show Hey, you just bought yourself an amplifier off of eBay, Amazon, Interboob, Interler Web, porn delivery device. And what do I do now? Do I just plug it in and turn it on? No. I, I had no, at that time, I didn't have the tool in the toolbox that I felt comfortable coming out on television. And like, or, uh, in my movies, as I, was told, I had a guy call me the other day, he goes, man, I really love your movies. I'm like, movies? I mean, YouTube videos, dude. Goes, but yeah, your, your YouTube videos aren't shot on a handy cam. Or, you know, handy, he said handy cam. <laughs> shot on a phone, I think is what he was getting at. Um, 
I didn't have the tool that I wanted to bring out and show you because it's like, this worked well enough for me, but then I got to run it through that filter of, hey, um, if I show this on camera, somebody's going to go out and build this and they don't understand that there's some limitations to it and they might end up killing themselves. So that's why I had to cut a whole section out and it, the whole section that I'm talking about is the part where I'm like, and don't do this. Okay. I'm talking about taking a screwdriver and shoving it in a cabinet and shorten up the tube. It's, you don't want to do that. It's so dangerous. Uh, screwdrivers are, well, they're designed with an insulated value of about 600 volts on most parts. The U, to get the UL listing to be an electrical screwdriver, it has to have at least a 600 volt rating. And that's not to say that all screwdrivers are 600 volts because they're not. Um, I used to have a beautiful set of wood screwdrivers wood handled screwdrivers that well, they're still around here someplace I think they're up in the attic but uh, my dad had a set like them. I always liked how they felt in my hand so when I first started this thing I went out and I bought them and if you go back go back and look uh, 2000 something videos ago um, you might see them on the old workbench at the other place I had to get rid of those because I realized right right quickly that those are for like finish work doing woodworking and working on cars and that kind of thing. They're not for what we do here. That's the reason that I went to the Kleins. Um, they're a little bit, the fact that I got a little tiny bit of rubber for me to touch my meat beaters on, um, that and they're UL listed. They're not uh, China excrement listed. They're legitimately tested. That means somebody's gone down there and they've said, okay, um, the 600 volts is a 10% insulation value. Um, you know, down there in the desert of New Mexico where the, the U, one of the UL labs is at. And they've done the high voltage testing on it. And I have faith that this will give me roughly 120 volts to 240 volts worth of insulation. Okay. I had a lot to explain. I'm just saying. Just saying we got to think about the bigger picture. So let's drill one more hole in this. Then we're going to solder up some shit. And then we're going to put some heat shrink on some shit. And then we're going to be done. Ding, 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 da, 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 One last little safety tip about working with, with Teflon is you don't ever want to sand it. And if you are in the environment to where it decides that it needs to be on a wire that gets hot enough that somehow manages to get it to burn or it gets turned into a particulate of air matter somehow very fine Teflon is horrible for you to digest into your body especially through your respiratory system yeah when you're like you know 55 years old and you start having breathing disorder issues and they're gonna ask you were ever exposed to anything that might cause the answer to that would be yes. You know, I sat around and I braved a bunch of Teflon dust as I was sanding and working with it my entire life. And I mean this, I mean this in a serious, I mean, come on, I joke a lot about only causes cancer in California. Th this is like the beryllium and the transistor feet. You don't want to really sand this. You don't want to turn this into a powder. You really want to try, try and avoid ingesting this in your body. That, that's with all seriousness attached in my heart with that tip to Amazon now scared to shop that's all I've got for one inch I'm looking for like an inch and a half man I thought I had a ton of this stuff I must have used a bunch okay off to Amazon gotta go order some stuff almost out of two inch this is commercial not commercial but consumer side uh, two inch and what I mean consumer side is um, that's what they would sell to the com uh, consumer basis, two inch marine grade heat shrink. This is commercial, rested, uh, tested, 600 volt, um, epoxy resin based heat shrink. They serve two completely different purposes in the world. This, this is actually really designed to do, to work with. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we used to do when I was building cable TV systems. <clears throat> and I put this wrench on here. 
this stuff when it when it cools down that shit ain't moving uh, they think they have this thing called a bug nut it's a, actually a lash safety securement wire attachment clamp it's a clamp that you put on the 5h strand and then you're in the 5h you run the 5h strand between the, the poles and then you put this clamp on there and it's you can tighten down one side of the clamp and it pinches on the 5 8 line and then you can attach your lashing wire which is a form of stainless steel wire that you put inside this machine that spins on the line and it holds the cable to the 5 8 wire that goes between the poles. I digress. <clears throat> Different life, not me anymore, don't know anything about that, not Oryx certified, not fiber, not head end, I've never built a head end at a cable TV station or Ever, never, never will I ever, never, ever claim that I know anything about any of that shit. Anyhow, long story short, I've had this for, Jesus, decades. Had it, it, there's a lot of other chemicals that go on with this here, and this is literally just as hard as piss. I mean, you, I might as well have just welded that wrench on there. So when you're climbing up the pole with your, with your little, bloop, 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 you know, you're climbing up the pole with your, 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 your belt and stuff, you want to take up the least amount of shit that you can have fall off and the least amount of shit you can carry. So you start creating your own tools where it's like, I use this to cut the wire every day. How about I can go snip and then take this while holding onto the wire, tighten down the lash and not have to put this in the back of my bag, and pull it and then tighten the thing back up. No, I did not think of this. Way smarter people in this world than myself, and they had already figured this out long before I was even. That was probably sperm in my dad's testicles when some guy thought that up. But needless to say, this is the real deal stuff, and this is what we're going to use because we don't need anything more than this. This will adequately do what I want to have do here. Okay, now I've wasted enough time. I forgot to plug in my soldering irons when we started. So I've been waiting this whole time for the soldering irons to heat up. Okay, let's put this all together and I'll show you the finished product. There's some cool properties to working with high voltage wire. Um, the fact that they claim that this wire here you can put um, like 100,000 volts, that's what it says printed on the side, until I took, I took acetone and I cleaned all this wire up the other night. They call this 100 kV wire. That that little piece of shit in the center of this wire, and then right here is 100,000 volts safe. I, I mean, I would not believe that but that's what they claim um see like on the outside here they've got uh, awm style 3239 40 kv dc okay and that's a guaranteed rate at up to 150 degrees celsius so the things that they're telling you here in this first statement are really important the type of strand that it is going to be, the type of style of wire, the environment it's designed to go in. We're going to tell you it's a lot amount. We're going to tell you how many volts it's rated for. And what I mean, they think, what they're stating by that is that let's say that this black towel is a piece of metal. In theory, you could run 40,000 volts through this, low amps, of course, and have it laying against the case, and it's supposedly not going to arc through supposedly um <clears throat> hence the reason they say dc okay and uh then we go on to talk about all the compliance issues this can survive and continue to maintain this rating up to 150 degrees celsius and then it's going to give you um, the rubber that it's made out of the silicone that's made out of and then the corset gauge style and an American wire gauge standard. So it's usually printed on everything like this. It has anything to do with high voltage. Teflon, you can't print anything to it. Nothing sticks to it, nothing. The downside with high voltage wire is that it's usually fairly high strand count, um, but the wire on the inside of it does not bode well to being, having torque load put on it. So we can solder that lead on here and then we twist this three or four times, the wire is gonna snap off. So how we're going to go about mitigating that is this the reason we drilled the hole through the shorting stick and we're wanting to keep this mess as small as possible because we want to maximize this distance from here to here as much as possible. This is, remember, it's not all this shit that makes it safe or this, it's this. 
And that's why we want to take care of this. We don't want to put this where it's going to get dirty on it, get dirt on it. It's going to have oil on it. We want to look at this as a very reverent tool, kind of like Grandma's Gideon Bible that sat on top of her TV, which we all know. We all had the Grandma that had this beautiful TV that she got, and then the TV died, and she put like a, a doily or something over it, and then we got a new TV and put it on it, on top of that TV stand, and right next to it was the Gideon Bible. That's the joke. We're going to help mitigate that by doing this even more. I want to support that joint to the maximum potential that I can give it to survive. I mean, straight up. So now, we'll heat this up. I gotta go around the camera. Come around the camera. Oh, of course. You're gonna unplug yourself. Only the best from China. Okay, here we go. Nothing sticks to Teflon, for the most part. But a heat shrink has got enough resistant surface area that it, it'll, it'll support itself and it won't slide away. Oh, before we get any further along, come here. And this is, of course, uh, consumer grade epoxy marine heat shrink. There we go. Okay. I'm going to pull down on this. A little bit of pinch, pinch pressure here. So if you buy a Teflon label maker machine, what you're buying yourself is a fancy ass um, like laser printer or ink printer that'll allow you to print to the heat shrink that then you in turn can slide over the wire, shrink onto the wire and have a label on the wire. Because there's nothing that you're gonna ever have print to the Teflon itself. And there's very few things that'll actually print to the silicone wire that'll stay. Like I said, I just took a fairly aggressive alcohol and I rubbed this wire off. I want to make the wire as clean as possible. Now from here, when I go and get the last little bit, which we're going to hook up here in a second, get it attached. Of course we got to test this, you know, but from here I'm going to hang this like I do with my high voltage probe. My high voltage probe hangs right here. And I have it stuffed in the corner for a reason. And I have it set up on prongs so that nothing going to hit the tip and it chills out over here in the corner. That's where that lives because I don't want anything to hit that. I don't want any scratches. I don't want any oil. I don't want any dirt exposure. I don't want any of that because that I stick my hand on the other end of that and go how many volts? Same thing here. I'll create a nice little living space for this, but let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Okay, so you remember how me saying the twisting and the torque, torsion, torque, torque load of uh, the wire, high voltage wire doesn't, okay. So the part that you would normally take and bend over the wire and then cramp down on the wire to give yourself a electrical connection, I mean pressure bond, I mean bullshit connection, um, I took and I trimmed that portion of this back so that it was more... You know, you had you, you have a metal bar that comes off the back, and then you have the ear that supposedly folds over the wire, and then you crimp onto the wire that's supposed to create the, the good connection, which it doesn't. It bullshit connection solder. That ear, I took and I trimmed it off at an angle, so it's more like a knife blade. And I'm going to capitalize on the fact that this shit is soft, and I took and I slid that in on the clamp until it's actual bits about that far up into the, the portion of the wire here let's see let's let's do this let's go okay and then we'll go uh, okay see that see how that work so we're gonna go by and we're gonna solder this to give it a good electrical connection not a pressure connection which is shit um, I'm sorry I like having magic pixie dust on everything that allows the electrons to, s to flow more smoothly 
there there is a time and there's a very well documented place for um, the pressure connection. In my opinion, the pressure connection supports the solder joint. In most people's opinions and the way they think about things, the pressure connection is what makes the joint. The solder just ruins everything. So, <laughs> whatever. So, knowing that this is going to be the most damaged joint as far as like moving it around, uh, we're going to solder this and then we are going to sneak some more marine grade heat shrink underneath this clip end and then we'll be done. So, let's pretend like we know what we're doing with the solder. There it goes. Is that a little bit more? Help me make sure we get the wire nice and stiff all the way up inside the jacket so it'll break in a place that we cannot easily find. Nope, there we go. We got a good joint. Okay. We'll go ahead and we'll throw a little bit of heat shrink on the end of this, and that's about all we can do. I know for a fact I'm going to be replacing this two or three times. Uh, I am going to go find a different clamp than this, but I still think that bag of $10 parts is kick-ass. I'm just saying. I think it's kick-ass. Okay, let's have some fun. So, we're going to use our Variac. We're going to run that into our neon sign transformer. We're going to need earmuffs because we are going to make a couple loud bangs here in a minute. We've got a very rudimentary high voltage rectifier, which we'll see if it holds together for more than a couple hits. Um, we're not going to be doing this with the power supply on. We're going to charge this little thing, which is focus there we go 6000 kv 4 mf so not a whole lot of storage but a lot of high voltage so this will be enough for the demonstration so the way we got this set up is i know that it looks like on vajeo that this wire here is touching it is not none of this is touching anything and i know it looks like on vajeo these two wires are crossing they are not nothing is touching here either we've got ourselves adequate amount of space. So we've got our high voltage wires laying down on the table, coming out of the transformer, and then our post rectification, we've got everything separated by multiple inches. Okay? So, let's go ahead and let's charge this mess up. Jump around the camera. And uh, get the variable down. We got the green blinky light over here. So there, there's a thousand volts. No transformer's tripping out. Must have a diode that's gone bad. There we go. No. We have a high voltage breakdown someplace. Let's go identify it. Well, I'm kidding. This is actually the perfect scenario for this test. There's no bleeder in this circuit. And so the whole idea was is I'd charge this cap up and then I'd use the shorting bar and make a big loud bang and impress you all. But this is literally the most perfect scenario for this. There's a thousand plus volts worth of death here and the high voltage isn't coming off. So let's give this a whack. <laughs> all right, here we go. Ready, set. That's enough to kill you right there. That's all there is to it. Dink, done. So what's the FLIR tell us? Oh yeah. My rectifiers are screaming hot. There's something wrong with this electrolytic. Let's go ahead and we'll bleed the high voltage off one more time.
Turn the power supply back off. Nice. 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 Okay, so we changed the rectifier circuit a little bit. Let's see if we can get this in frame for you all. Go to manual focus a little bit. We'll split the focus field close and near. All right, so let's put a little bit more juice to the pipe and then I gotta move on. So we're gonna, I'm sure in the future, I'll have the ability to test this thing all the way out. But I wanna show you how much energy is being stored in this cap, just even at 4,000 volts. So let's go ahead, we'll charge our cap. There's 4,060, 4,070, 4,080. So this is a little bit more energy than what's in your 3-500 Z box, let's say. But there's more than enough shit here to kill you, dead like shaking hands with Moses, dead, okay? <laughs> this cap's only got four microfarad worth of storage in it. Your power supply in your 3500Z, uh, 3CX, 1500A7, uh, 3CX800s, that kind of thing, has more storage capability than this little cap by, it's usually about 16 to 21 microfarads. So about roughly three to four times more storage. So that would mean the arc would be three to four times bigger because there's three to four times more current or amp storage. Okay, let's go ahead, we'll shut our power supply off. In we go. That should scare the crap out of you because it scares the crap out of me. Do you get why the, the ground strap's on there now? Because it's harder than hell to carry this, uh, uh, and then hold that in place, no. Initial shock, and then sit there and hold it shorted. And we hold it shorted. That way any free your own electrons that are still in that cap can fully be dissipated. That way there's nothing left. And then the next step, after we do this, reach in here and grab this. The next step after we do this is now that we have the circuit isolated, we're going to attach a ground, attach a ground, and now we're in a safe environment. Yay. Finally get to show that on camera, and that is the appropriate way to do things. All right. Let's, let's clean this up. I wish I had a I wish I had an oil can that was big enough to demonstrate what I want to do, but I do, but they're buried and I don't want to totally fart around with that today. Okay, so we've grabbed another um, 7,000 or 8,000 volt oil filled, but this one is also at 4 MU or uh, MFD, okay? So let's go ahead and we'll charge Ooh, I spot something potentially dangerous. See that lead? Nope, you can't see the lead. See that lead? They're actually touching. So we're at 1400 volts. Let's go in here and let's neutralize our circuit. Ground, 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 ground. Don't get in a hurry. Now we're free to stick our fingers in there without locking the circuit out for a second or two. OK. 
Okay. All right. Now, let's try this again. This is going to bang, man. It'll be fun. Why that slowly charging? I want to go over here and get my safety squints. I want to get a condom for my eye. Literally. Charging to four thousand volts, Captain. He's alive. All right. We'll neutralize our power supply, and in we go again. <laughs> but see, there's still sixty, seventy volts present inside the circuit, even after the the arc discharge. And we could sit here, and over time, we'll watch that voltage climb. See that? And over time, that'll climb and climb. There's 10. So now there's 100 volts present in the circuit. Right? Oh, no, there's 10 volts in the circuit. Pardon me. So <clears throat> that's the reason that on all electrolytic, high voltage electrolytic capacitors, we short the terminals out, is to keep the, keep the caps at zero reference. Because over time, you don't know, there might be a couple hundred volts on this cap, and that's going to hurt a lot when it comes in and gets you. So let's go ahead and deplete this fully. Drop to zero. Let's slide this over here. Here, let's do it one more time. So now imagine how big of an arc you're going to get with twice the amount of high voltage storage and literally twice the voltage. It's a significant electrical pulse that we're, we're getting rid of here. A huge discharge. 4,130 volts. Here we go. And I like that this is so flexible because I can squish it and make it go between both contacts. Oh, I like it. I like it. Proof of concept. Tested. Certified. Whatever. <laughs> Gentlemen, my name is BBI. And I want to say thanks for tuning in. Um, try this at your own risk, own peril. It's just I wanted to document how to build one of these things and make it safely. Um, we way overbuilt this, but that's the point when it comes to playing with the demon gremlins that want to kill you and don't give anything a, a crap, anything not one about you. Overbuild, not underbuild. I'm going to go do some other stuff, take care of some customers finally. This, this week has been nightmare for me, and I apologize I haven't gotten any YouTube videos up for you all to watch. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed this one. Thanks to every single one of you guys. I'm out of here. I appreciate you. We'll see you. Bye-bye.